yet have published estimates on the prevalence of such disorders in the UAE. Based on my experience working here in the last five years, I would assume that they are similar to that documented across other nations. For example, the latest 2014 statistics from the CDC organization in the U.S. indicate that one in 68 American children are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, or autism for simplicity in this case. I believe this would be about the same in the UAE, which if we estimate to be about 1% of our population in a country of 9 million, over 9 million people, that would add up to over 90,000 cases of ASD here. And that's probably on the conservative side. So then that leaves the prevalence of all the other type of communication and language disorders to be much less in numbers, but not necessarily less in significance on a child's healthy development. We still do see many children with other less pervasive disorders, such as a distinct language disorder, primarily affecting receptive or expressive language, but not the social development component, or a speech sound disorder, which is a purely phonological articulation disorder, of deficits or stuttering, which is a fluency disorder, or other unspecified communication disorders that do not meet the full criteria for a diagnosis such as autism spectrum disorder. We now also have a specific diagnosis called social communication disorder, which affects a child's social and pragmatic use of language and communication skills, but does not carry the stereotypy behavioral features seen in autism. Another reason for the high numbers with ASD uh, is especially if a child presents on a moderate to severe end of the spectrum, exhibiting more of those pervasive features such as those odd repetitive behavioral stereotypes or that obvious non-verbal presentation, is that parents and teachers are more likely to see those features as delays or problems requiring clinical intervention. I think that's the main reason why, for example, at our center, which is known for providing specialized services in this area, we do receive so many ASD referrals. Also keep in mind that fortunately there is a general increase of awareness of autism as well as improvement in skilled clinicians who can properly diagnose this disorder. As a licensed psychologist, we are trained to administer comprehensive diagnostic assessments to carefully evaluate and differentiate all kinds of developmental and mental health disorders. A good assessment based on well-established standardized measures is necessary to properly make a diagnostic interpretation and provide best intervention recommendations. So while many of us trained clinicians can more easily suspect a potential diagnosis, something like autism or communication disorder or learning disorders, for example, should only be diagnosed after administration of a complete assessment battery. In assessing for autism spectrum disorder specifically, the psychologist wants to include tests that measure cognitive ability, language skills, both receptive and expressive, executive functioning skills, or usually dysfunction in their case, unfortunately, that is looking at specific areas such as working memory, emotional control, and emission tendencies. Also, behavioral and emotional measures. Generally, these are the parent and teacher questionnaires that provide information on the child's repetitive or odd behaviors, level of anxiety, depression, etc. Uh, in addition, adaptive skill measures, which provide more insight on the child's, da child's daily functioning and ability to care for themselves and interact in the community, for example. Finally, any other diagnostic measures can be included that specifically assess children with autism or communication disorders. Again, I would emphasize that a proper assessment is necessary in order to formally diagnose a child with such a disorder given that an incorrect label can potentially be detrimental to that child's acceptance or placement in schools, for example, or possibly limit other opportunities for receiving appropriate intervention. However, because it is the parent or teacher or pediatrician who has best access to see critical signs early, I would recommend that all those involved in a young child's life be aware of potential signs or developmental problems to get the child tested as early as possible. First symptoms often involve language delay development. Also, lack of social interest or unusual social interactions, for example, pulling in individuals by their hand without really making any attempt to look at them. 
or odd play, like carrying toys around, but never really playing with them. Unusual communication patterns are another sign. So for example, knowing the alphabet, but not responding to your name. And then in the second year, you may start seeing more odd, repetitive behaviors that are observed um, on a more regular basis. And then typical play is a big one that is uh, good to look out for because oftentimes for children on the spectrum, typical play is absent. So while they may be sitting alongside the toys, they are not necessarily playing functionally with them. Two of the examples of the features that may raise alert to a caregiver and encourage professional screening, but by no means is this equivalent to any formal diagnosis. So again, you do want to get a proper comprehensive assessment done by a licensed psychologist to make sure that your child has the right diagnosis if they even do meet criteria. standpoint, I believe that pediatricians have the best access to screen and refer children with autism or communication disorders, and so it is crucial that they be highly familiar with such disorders and referral processes. Unlike most other professionals, pediatricians have the given opportunity to follow a child regularly from birth through their early childhood years, so they are in a position to take in very important data along the way, not only the strictly medical measures. They also have the authorization to appropriately refer to specialists, such as a clinical psychologist for testing, when they do suspect those developmental problems. Moreover, parents tend to highly respect their child's pediatrician, sometimes more so than the school staff or friends or others in their community. So in my opinion, a pediatrician carries an invaluable positive influence in the best interest of their patients. Another crucial point I would like to add is that early intervention can make a huge difference in the development outcome of a properly diagnosed child with autism, for example. So for pediatricians to understand enough on such disorders so that they make appropriate referrals for proper testing early on, it could make a huge significant difference between a child that has little improvement over the years and a child that may be considered as recovered from autism later on. Research in the U.S. shows that though most autism diagnoses get made after the age of four years, a qualified clinician can actually make a proper diagnosis as early as two years of age. So you can imagine the difference a two-year head start with good intervention can make on a child with such disadvantages. There's a study from a group in San Diego that has initiated great potential in pediatricians using screening during their patients' 12-month well child visits. What they used was a screener called the CSBS DP, it's an infant toddler checklist, and it's composed of 24 questions that measure whether a child passes or fails in multiple developmental areas. Results show that for those children that pediatrician, pediatrician scored as failing, actually 20% of those children went on to have an autism diagnosis, and 55% went on to have a learning disorder or a development delay diagnosis of some sort. So these results are extremely encouraging in setting relevant protocol policies for pediatricians today and also highlighting the value that pediatricians contribute in early diagnosis and screening procedures in their clinics. The Air Pediatric Medical Conference is a platform that will be extremely important because it gathers both policymakers from the health authorities and the top pediatricians and health specialists from the region. It will be covering the most important challenges facing health professionals today in different pediatric subspecialties through sharing case studies, presentations, and workshops coming from key international and local experts in the region. So I am quite excited about this. Also, the conference will be highlighting the importance of pediatric research in the region, which is a positive step forward for us. There will be the Arabic Pediatric Medical Research Award, which will be recognizing outstanding research in the field of pediatrics and hopefully promoting ongoing interest in this much needed industry and community. And relevant to the topics I have introduced, I think it's a powerful platform to open consideration for policies such as mandatory early screening for autism, which could make a world of a difference in getting early treatment and essentially in a child's potential in life. 
So again, something I am very much looking forward to.